Good afternoon, everyone. This is Tim Gleisner, Head of Collections at the Library of Michigan. Today, talking with another 2020 Michigan Notable Book author, this time Sally Walker, author of Deadly Aim, uh, published by Henry Holt and Company. Uh, this is a book about the Ashinaabe, uh, uh, Native American soldiers who fought in the Civil War uh, and who came all from Northern Michigan. And so today we're here with Sally. Sally, how are you today? I'm fine, thanks. Good. And so Sally, we're sitting here, we're going to talk, and just to tell you, this is really one of the only young adult titles that we chose for the Michigan Notable Book Program this year. Uh, a lot of people thought this was a significant title, very thoroughly researched. So this is something that really uh, spoke to a lot of the committee members. And if people aren't familiar, we have committee members from around the state, librarians, booksellers, and academics, who all sit down once a month for about 12 months and decide on the, the every year's top 20 titles. So Sally, thank you for being here with us and thank you for well, coming all the way from DeKalb, Illinois, or <laughs> virtually. <laughs> it was and an so, easy trip. <laughs> yeah, right? So let me ask you something. So give us a little background on yourself. Why did you become a writer? Um, I have always wanted to be a writer. I can remember telling my high school guidance counselor that I wanted to write children's books when I grew up. And um, she told me it wasn't a real job, that it wasn't something that I could do. Um, and she suggested that I, I look at something else. So I actually went to college and studied archaeology and geology. Uh -huh. um, and then after I had my children and started working in a bookstore, uh, which is reading is one of my first loves, um, I said to my husband, I still really want to write children's books. And he said, go ahead, give it a try. And I started out um, proposing an I, four ideas for a company that was looking for somebody who could write about earth science books, which was my college major. Cool. And I suggested earthquakes, volcanoes, um, glaciers, and caves. And they said, oh, we're interested in all of those ideas. Choose one. And it was 100 degrees here in DeKalb, so I chose glaciers. It was a July, and I thought, okay, I'll do that. Maybe it will make me feel, feel cooler. And I've just, that was, boy, 32, 33 years ago. Really? And I've never stopped writing since then. Um, so how many books have you written total, Sally? It's about 60. 60. Yeah. So I have to ask, so this book that you've written now that's been chosen as a notable book title, this is a departure from the earth sciences. So has it always been earth sciences or have you done various topics across the... What I've done, um, initially my early books were earth science and then I moved into some animal type books, um, dolphins, manatees, seahorses, things like that. Um, and then about maybe 15 years ago, um, I started to write a book about the coelacanth, which is a fish that um, scientists basically thought it went extinct with the dinosaurs, and then yes. they found one in 1938 that was still yeah. alive. Um, and I decided to write it as a story. We call it narrative nonfiction now in the, in the children's book world anyway. Um, so it was telling a story of the scientists and what they did. And I just love that the freedom of that style and from that, I went into my second love, which would be archaeology, and started writing about some archaeological topics concerning Jamestown and a, a Civil War submarine that was found. Um, and I realized what I, what I love most, uh, history is my second love after archaeology and, and uh, geology, that's slashed as one topic. Um, I realized what I like to do is write stories that deal with unknown things in history. And if I can get a little bit of science in there, that's, that's great. Um, and mystery, things that people don't know about at all. Um, and, and that's kind of the direction that my writing has taken in the last 15 years. So you talk about the coelacanth, and I know this is completely off topic, but I remember there was an adult title maybe about 15, yes. 16 years ago that I was fascinated with. Yep. Yep. Do you remember that title? I sure I do. I sure do because I had read that book and actually was in touch with the author quite a oh, bit right. um, after okay. when I was thinking about writing this book uh, or that book on the coelacanth. It was called Fossil Fish Found Alive. Yes. And um, when, when I was ready to propose the idea to the publisher, I called my editor and said, 
I would really like to do this book on a seal account. And she goes, I can't believe you're calling. I was going to call you this week and say, we would really like you to do a book on the seal account. So I think that book that you saw and that I saw really got a lot of people thinking. Oh, it did. And I remember, and I'm sorry, and I'm totally hijacking the conversation. But it's okay. <laughs> that book, that book, because I was a young librarian and I was leading book discussions somewhere in Michigan or New York State. And I remember that book I just found fascinating and made my group, whatever group it was, to read that book. Um, and it was, and if nobody knows, I just have to say real quick, it was a, a prehistoric fish, South Africa for some reason, remind, yes. I remind yep. of that now. Yep. Boy, I haven't thought of that in a long time. Thank you for that memory, Sally. It's awesome. <laughs> you're welcome. So you're writing all these books, getting back to you. <laughs> you're writing all these books and, um, you know, how often do you write? Do you have a regimen? Do you have a, 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 you know, a set time in the day? Like, how often are you writing? I would say I'm a great procrastinator. Um, so I don't necessarily write every day. However, when a deadline starts to get closer, uh, where I might initially have been writing, say, an hour or two hours a day, Right. Uh, and I don't usually write on the weekends. That's my time off. But um, when a deadline gets closer, and by closer, I mean a month out from the deadline, I'll start writing pretty much from about eight in the morning until five or five thirty at night. Wow. Uh, quick break for lunch, play a few games of solitaire on the computer, and then, you know, it's back to work again. So, um, and, and I w I'd have to say too, when I am writing at those long periods of time, eight to five thirty ish, um, the time passes as though it was just an hour for me. Uh, you, I get really immersed in, in what I'm saying and, or what I'm writing. And for a book like Deadly Aim, uh, where I'm writing and literally telling the story of these, of these men, I can sometimes write a couple of pages a day, three pages a day maybe, or four pages a day, depending on you know, how it's going. Uh, but for my science books, more like the Fossil Fish book, uh, I might spend three days on two paragraphs. Wow. So I never know exactly what the output's going to be. Can I ask, um, just, just out of curiosity, so you get a contract for a book, typically how long do you have to write a children's book? I mean, how? Usually about a year. Okay. Yeah, if it's going to be something of length, like Deadly Aim, usually about a year, maybe 18 months. It just kind of, kind of depends on what the publish, publisher schedule is like sure. and how much they have scheduled. Okay, so, you know, you're writing these books. We talked about the Seal of Camp and how you were inspired by a, an adult author. Which writers do you read? I mean, who do you go to? What are, are there children's authors that you really take inspiration from or is it mainly adult subjects and titles? Um, I, well, before I became a full-time writer, I was actually a children's book buyer for an independent bookstore for a number of years. Oh, really? Uh, and yeah, and also a children's literature consultant. So I've taught that at the university level as far as evaluating children's literature is concerned. So I read a lot of kids' books. Sure. Uh, and of I would be foolish if I said I didn't admire J.K. Rowling because I really do. Um, okay. And uh, I love another uh, children's author. He's passed, passed on now, Lloyd Alexander. He did, did more fantasy science fiction okay. uh, type writing. In the adult market, um, I am a total mystery junkie. Oh, are you? Who? just adore mysteries, and I will read almost anything. Almost one, of, one of my favorite authors is Louise Penny. Oh, okay. And she writes a series about an inspector from Canada named um, Armand Gamache. And when she gets her books out, I buy one and then I let it sit next to my bed. That's where my reading stack is. Um, and I will keep putting it to the bottom of the pile because I so love her writing that I want to just wait so that I'll savor it. And the closer I get to the end, the slower I'll read, which is, you know, normally I can knock off a book in two days. <laughs> so so you're, talking um, about, you're talking about Canadian mysteries. You must have read Giles Blunt before then. Right. No, I oh, haven't. You haven't. Oh, well, all right. I'll, I'll leave B that alone. B-L-U-N-T. Okay. I will look that up. Inspector, I, I can't remember the inspector's name, but 
Okay. Yeah, totally uh, derailing. It's good to have a, a fellow book nerd here. This oh, well, and, and then the other books that I just can't get enough of uh, are David McCullough's books, his history oh. books. It's like, oh my God, I heard, we went and heard him um, speak. Uh, he came to one of the bookstores that I work for. Yeah. And the audience was, I would say 500 people. Sure. And for the hour that he talked, you could have heard a pin drop in there. Um, it was, he's so incredibly awesome i've only i've only seen him one time it was last year at the national book festival about his book uh, pioneers oh. the, room, the room was several thousand people so it was not an intimate experience yeah. but the man is i mean he's just a treasure a complete treasure really, yeah. let me ask you work for an independent bookstore how long um well the one where i was the children's book buyer i, I worked there for seven years and then when i left to write full time Another independent bookstore, uh, Anderson's Bookshop in Naperville, Illinois, called me and they said, you can't be out of the children's book world. Come and work for us in any way you want to. Um, mm -hmm. So then I worked for them for about 20 years. Wow. But always at, at conferences where I was their uh, book talker on a national level. We would go to the big national conferences and I would book talk about the, the new sure. books that teachers and librarians couldn't live without. Makes sense. So let me ask, with your love of mysteries, have you ever done a mystery book for kids? I've done science mystery type books for kids. Like uh, I've been with the Smithsonian archeologists on a dig where we excavated uh, colonial skeletons. Cool. And so we, it was that treating it like a mystery. What will we find from these bones? What can the stories of these bones tell us? Um, I would love to write a real, I mean, a, a fiction mystery. Yeah. Um, and I've got one in the back of my mind, but, um, I have to admit, I I'm a nonfiction author. I'm chicken. I'm afraid that I w wouldn't be able to do it. So um, well, That's fair. I, I couldn't do it. I don't think I could do it. Well, that's awesome. So like, getting back to the subject of the yeah. how did you get the idea for this book? You're from Illinois. How did you know about, what is it, Company K? How did you know about these guys? How did you figure out about this story? Well, um, I had no idea at all who they were. I was actually doing uh, research for my book, Sinking the Sultana, which is about a steamboat that sank in the Mississippi River in 1865. It's carrying about 2,200 paroled prisoners of war from Cahaba and Andersonville prisons. Okay. And it sank about seven miles north of Memphis, Tennessee. And we went down, my husband and I went down to uh, a very small museum down in Arkansas um, about the Sultana and they, I mean, tiny museum, it is a storefront and mm -hmm. they had a mural on one wall that had the names listed of all of the people who had been determined to have been on the Sultana when it sank. And there were like 1300 people killed when it, when it sank, the boilers exploded. Um, and I'm reading down the names to get information, just general information type stuff. And I came across Amos Ashkabudnike. And I thought, well, that's a strange name. And then farther down, when I got to the M's, there was Lewis Miskagoan. And they both came from the first Michigan sharpshooters. Okay. And the names were different enough from anything I would normally hear that I figured, who were these guys? Um, and so I did a little bit of research. And at that point, I was just about ready to wrap up kind of the research and writing. And all I could find at that point was that they were two Ash Anishinaabe men from Michigan in a sharpshooters regiment. And um, that was about it at that point. But I was really intrigued by that because frankly, it blew me away that, that American Indians had fought in the Civil War. I, I didn't know that it happened at the time. Um, and I felt like, okay, I want, I want to know more about them. So after the Sultana book kind of got put to bed, um, I just was compelled to start doing research into these two men. And it led me into the entire story then of the guys that were with them. And the, and the more I learned, the more I researched, uh, the more I realized, no, these guys, their story needs to be told. This is amazing. Sure. sure. So let me ask, so to conduct that research, how hard was it? I mean, were you doing a lot of trips up to Michigan? Uh... Um, I've been to Michigan now three times, okay. I think, to do research. Um, I would have to say that doing the research for this book, 
I, and I always call research an adventure. To me, that's what research is. It's an adventure. Um, were the best research adventures that I've ever had in my entire career and some of the most rewarding experiences that I've had in my life as well. Um, to go in Michigan, um, I used the uh, Clark Historical Library in Mount Pleasant, um, which is just, oh my God, there's so many stories in that library. It's amazing. It's um, nice. Yeah. And then uh, we were in Grand Haven for a while, uh, kind of walking over some of the areas where uh, William DuVernay and John Kedgenall came from, who were two men that were in the company, but not in Company K. They were in, they were in a regiment. They were actually in uh, Company B. Sure. Um, and then we spent several days up on the peninsula. Leelanau, thank you. I'm just, That's all right. I'm getting too excited here. Uh, the Leelanau Peninsula, which is just a lovely place. Um, walking on, on the lands, the properties where a number of the guys lived. And then we did the same thing and went on over to Petoskey and up to Cross Village. And, you know, so for me, I'd never been on the upper part of the mitten before. Um, so that was quite an experience to do that. Um, we also visited as many graves that were in Michigan as we could. Um, but then the lion's share of the research then was actually focused on the East Coast, where we went to all of the battlefields where the uh, company fought, and then also the National Archives as well to, to go through the uh, pension records and military records from the, from the regiment there. So can I ask, like, what was the most surprising thing that you found in your research, do you think? Oh, this is so cool. Um, one of the young men in the company was a, a, a young man who was 19 years old named Charles Allen. That was his English name. Um, his Anishinaabe name has been just sort of lost. Um, he always used Charles when he signed things. Um, and for some reason, I just got caught up in his, his story. Um, he, he was 19 years old when he died at um, the Battle of the Wilderness. He was the first member of the company to be killed. Um, he could speak English fluently. He'd gone to school in Ohio at an academy in Twinsburg there. Um, and he'd work already as a translator by that time. And he was brought into the company as a sergeant, which was, there weren't officers that were Native Americans in, um, in, in companies that had Native, Native Americans in them or in color, United States color troops. The uh, actual black people were not the officers. It was always the white, white officers. Um, so I really got interested for some reason in Charles Allen. And so while we were at the um, National Archives, and, and when I say we, my husband is my research chum. He comes along with me on everything. Nice. But so I got Charles Allen's pension folder, and I'm starting to read through the papers, and all of a sudden I came across three letters that he had written in Odawa, the Odawa language back in 1863 and 1864. And I don't know if you've ever been in the research room of the National Archives, but it's like a really quiet place. And I found these letters and I went, oh! And everybody turned and looked at me and the uh, workers there came over and started, you know, oh my gosh, what are you, what are you, what's wrong? And I said, I found these letters there in Odawa. And I mean, the hair was standing up on my arms. And of course I couldn't read a word of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, and when I came home, I, I did contact uh, somebody that I know who has d done quite a bit of work on Company K and has a number of friends in the Native community. And he contacted some of the folks at some of the universities in, in Michigan. And well, no, they couldn't seem to um, translate them. I don't know why they actually didn't ask just a regular person, but they didn't. Um, and ultimately through a strange ser cir series of circumstances, um, I, a children's book writer, ended up having probably one of the world's most respected Odawa language professors in California. Really? Translated the letters for me because he was so tickled that they had been found. Um, he's written the authoritative di dictionary on, you know, the Ojibwe, Ojibwe language or, uh, you know, and 
But that was just amazing then to actually read Charles Allen's letters. Um, and then when we were at Fredericksburg, um, there was one mansion there called Brompton House mm -hmm. that had been um, converted into a military hospital for first for Confederate soldiers, then for Union soldiers. And one of the surgeons who worked in the hospital wrote in his uh, memoirs afterwards that while he was at Brompton, he treated four Indian sharpshooters in the front hallway of Brompton and a couple of them died. They were missing a limb, that kind of thing. And knowing that he was there right after the Battle of the Wilderness, right after Spotsylvania, I, I'd be willing to bet money that Charles Allen was one of the soldiers that he treated because of the severity of his, his wound. And to unexpectedly end up on a tour with the person who lived in the house, they invited me in and stand in that hallway and know that this is probably where the guy that I was so interested in died. Uh, tremendously moving experience for me. So now before you leave us hanging here, so what were the letters about? You, you Most of get the guy letters, from, yeah. well that, that, there again, that's very cool um, because Part of the thing of the letters was that he missed his family and that, um, you know, he was hoping that he could get back to visit them in the spring. Um, all, three of the, all three of the letters were written from Camp Douglas, which was a Confederate prisoner of war camp in Chicago. Okay. And that's the first place that um, the first Michigan sharpshooters were actually stationed. Right. Uh, yeah. But one of his letters talked about him testifying against a white man in a court trial that was taking place in Detroit. And what had happened was he and three of his comrades from Company K, all American Indians, um, had gone into a bar and the uh, saloon keeper served them all and one of the guys got drunk and um, the U.S. district, the army, I guess, behind it, decided to um, press charges against the saloon keeper because it was illegal to serve alcohol to American Indians. Mm. And so these four guys from Company K had to go from Chicago by train back to Detroit twice to testify in, in this case against a white man. And that's a very, very unusual thing. This is why the, um, the translator was so intrigued by the letters, because you don't see a, white, uh, an, a Native American testifying against a white person in court at that time period. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, as he mentioned, as Charles mentions in his letter to his family, uh, the saloon keeper was acquitted because the jury or the court decided that them being soldiers ranked higher than them being Indians. And it was okay to serve soldiers in the bar. And so he was freed. Huh. Yeah. Never heard of such a thing before. That's and, I mean, these records are in the National Archives in Chicago, south of Chicago there. Sure. sure. Yeah. Okay, so let me ask, because reading your book, you did a lot of preliminary history on the tribe itself. Uh, I mean, things like the old wing mission and things yes. like that. I mean, I, and I, being in West Michigan, I've, I've, I've known about these places and had read about them quite a bit. How important is Michigan as a setting for the overall story, for the overall tale? What, what is it about Michigan? Well, first of all, it, it's the homeland of, of the Ojibwe and Odawa that settled that didn't stay in Canada. I mean, they, they settled in, in Michigan and uh, as well as the Potawatomi down on the southern border. Um, so I think that's crucial um, because one of the reasons that they were willing to enlist in, in the uh, army was to try to protect their homeland mm. uh, in the sense that if the U.S. government would acknowledge them as soldiers and allies fighting to preserve the Union, maybe the U.S. government wouldn't take any more land from them. They wanted to keep their homeland in Michigan. I actually 
if you have if we have a minute i actually did mark something of their own words because i think it's very very um they're very lyrical and poetic but this was a letter that um um moses allen's father but not moses allen sorry Charles Allen, his father's name was Moses, actually signed that went to President John Tyler and, uh, and the Congress. And this, they wrote this in 1843. And what it said was, you know that if anything as plants or seeds is taken from one country to a different and distant one, and there is planted in a different soil not suited to it, it does not grow well, but is weak and sickly. So we think it would be with ourselves and children if we should be removed to a different and distant land. We therefore desire to remain on our native soil. The desire is that you will allow us to buy the lands where we now live, to become citizens of the state in which we live, and to become subject to and receive the protection of the laws of the American people. Hmm. Um, that general tone is reiterated 10 years later in another treaty. Um, so Michigan was sacred land to them, and it was their homeland. Um, and and it, I felt I deliberately started with some kind of two chapters almost on the early Anishinaabek moving into Michigan because I feel that their customs and their traditions are such an important part of the story that you can't separate the men from their heritage. Sure. No, that makes perfect sense. So how would you define this work? Is it a young adult title? How would you define it? Well, I define it as, I mean, technically it is considered a young adult title. Okay. But I look at it as a book that somebody who doesn't want to be overwhelmed with too much information is going to like it because you can read, I mean, in, in writing this book, I read volumes about the Battle of Spotsylvania and the battles of the wilderness and the crater. Right. So here you can dip in and you can find a really great story about some really fascinating guys. Um, but it's not told at a level that I don't, I mean, I don't, it's at a very readable level. That's what I would say. So going on that, what was so fascinating about these men? Like what was, what was a fascinating aspect? Well, first of all, that they enrolled at all and they were willing to fight for a government that basically was treating them horribly. Um, what I also found interesting too was, well, the individual stories, a lot of them. Uh, for example, there was one guy, Thomas Smith, who was in the, the uh, company. Now this is a company of sharpshooters, okay? They're known for their skill. To become a sharpshooter, a man had to be able to stand about 200 yards away from a 12 inch target wow. and he would get five shots at the target and then a person would measure how far the bullet holes were from the bullseye and you were allowed to have up to a total of 25 inches away to qualify okay um most of the white sharpshooters scored between 20 and 25 as a, as a rule, Company K scored in the teens. Huh. So they really were sharpshooters. But this one particular guy who intrigued me was Thomas Smith because he was born without a right hand. And he came to be interviewed, tested, enlist, he came to enlist. And you know, the, the um, man, uh, Lieutenant Drakes, who was, who was enlisting men, kind of looked at him and thought, okay, you know, a guy with one hand, everything. but that's how he was raised and he qualified without any problem at all. Um, there is a photo of him in the book, uh, mm -hmm. which came from the, um, oh, I'll call it the army hospital because I can't think of the technical name right now, but in Washington um, that they had taken of him and it shows that he only has um, one hand. And the reason the photograph was taken and the reason I left it in the book uh, was because he was hospitalized because he was having problems with his eyes at the time during the, during the war. And um, the doctors were trying to treat his, his stump because they figured he was having problems with an amputation. And he just kept telling them, no, no, that's how I've always been. And they were just flabbergasted that this guy 
had been allowed to enroll in the army, uh, let alone in a, in a division of sharpshooters. So. so let me ask, what was the hardest part of the whole experience writing this book? You know, the hardest part is after you've read a lot in pensions, you've gotten to know the family's names by uh, testi testimonies that are within pension folders, uh, seeing what, you know, his, what st straits the wives were left in afterwards, uh, the children that were left as orphans, uh, how the men's health deteriorated in past years. I think the hardest thing about writing a book like this is, is having a person who is, in a sense, a character, even though it's nonfiction, like Charles Allen, and having to kill them. Oh. I, you know, there were, there were men that I became very fond, fond of. Um, and, and to know that you have no choice. I mean, this was somebody who had so much potential. Um, mm. And for him to be just killed, I, I don't know. It, 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 that's very hard to do. I would, I would believe it, especially after you've gotten to know their story so intimately. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me ask, your husband does research, or he's your research buddy as you go across the country to these different places. Is he the one who reads your work as well before you submit it? No. And actually, I should say when my husband comes as my research buddy, <laughs> I do the research and he sits there reading. He's a geology professor. He sits there reading professional papers about geology while I'm <laughs> doing the research stuff. So, And he carries, he carries our lunch and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, so very good with directions. But uh, no, a book like Deadly Aim, that went to uh, three readers. Uh, one was Eric Hemingway, who is the archivist up at the um, Little Traverse Bay Band of Eric. Arawa. I know of Eric, yeah. Okay, so, and he's on the State Historical Commission too, which is so cool. Is. Um, so he read it for accuracy. Second person who read it for accuracy was Emmanuel Dab Dabney, who is the curator. Um, at Petersburg National Battlefield Park. He works mm -hmm. for the Park Commission. And so he is an expert on the battles out there in the Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania, Petersburg area. So he read it for accuracy. And then I also had um, Chris Chopek, who is uh, a, a Michigan historian, and he's written a book about Company K. It, it has a lot of individual uh, short uh, biographies. Well, not exactly biographies, but a lot of their uh, military history and names. I mean, it's a wealth of information in his book, Who is Who in Company K. Um, I also, and I think he may be one of the people who knows about as much as about Company K as anybody. And I had him read it also. For his, book, his book on Company K came out, what, 10 years ago or so? Yeah. Um, and I know there's been at least two editions. Okay. And there also was, uh, while my book was in press, another book came out, uh, Mr. Lincoln's Warriors by Kita Sher. I've never met her, but I have read the book. And, you know, if there are any listeners who might have a relative uh, associated with anybody who was in Company K, I would highly recommend her book because she just did a ton of research. And I was tickled to find out she had Charles Allen's letters in her book too. So oh, she yeah. approached it from a totally different angle, but you know, we both would have seen them in the National Archives, which okay. is cool, you know? That is very that cool. very but, cool. but she's got so much genealogical information in there that it is, it is just a treasure trove for anybody who might be looking into Anishinaabek history. Uh, genealogy. They will find a lot of information in it. Very nice. So let me ask you, what is the significance of the title Deadly Aim? What is Deadly what is Aim? It's because if a sharpshooter didn't have deadly aim, he didn't hit the target, which would have been the enemy soldiers. Okay. So um, you're always, I'm always looking for a title that will grab the young boy reader. And Deadly Aim that would do it. We'll do it. Yeah, exactly. I have a 13 year old. That would definitely do it. Yeah, for yeah. Sure. yeah. So Let me ask you, how hard was it to find these sources? I mean, you went to Clark Historical. You could have gone to Bentley. Uh, I mean, I did. I went to Bentley. Well, you did go to Bentley. Oh, yeah. 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 I went. To, I, well, I didn't tell you that. But yeah, I went to Bentley. I went to Clark. Um, how hard is it to find sources? Um, I've been a researcher for 30 years, and, and so for me, and libraries are like my totally favorite place in the world. 
to ever go. I mean, when we moved to DeKalb, before we went to the house that we first rented, we stopped at the public library oh, so nice. I could check it out. <laughs> um, and the, the children's librarian at the time, she said, well, you can't have a library card until we have something that's been addressed to you in the place where you're going to be living. And I said, but you don't understand. We just moved here from Nova Scotia. I need a library card. And she looked at me and she goes, you know, I think we'll make an exception in your case. We'll just get you one. So she did. But um, I think that once, once I start looking into a subject, I just keep digging. Um, and, and the more questions I ask, the more answers I get, the more answers I get, the more questions I have. And then it's always, then it always becomes a matter of where can I get this question answered? And, and for uh, deadly aim, you know, I wanted to see as many places as I could where they were. Unfortunately, time-wise, I couldn't get down to Andersonville prison. Um, but, um, you know, I've seen enough uh, movies of it, videos of it, and, and I've read certainly tons of books about it, right. um, so that I don't know that it would have made much of a difference. That said, um, being at the site where the Battle of the Crater was, uh, when the Pennsylvania unit had dug the, the tunnel underneath the uh, Confederate fort, and then exploded it uh, and then so many union men went into the um the crater formed by the explosion and then were just shot down i mean the bodies were eight eight bodies deep down there um to stand in the crater or at the crater uh in the morning at the same time the battle took place that is a very um emotional type of a of a setting to be in um, and, and to know what the, what the fighting was like there. Um, so you do get atmosphere when you, when you walk there, but I, you started this actually by research, asking how you get the research or find the places. I just, I just keep digging. I won't, I won't give up once I have a, a, something that I'm looking for. I just keep plugging away at it. So you said something interesting in your biography just there. So you came from Nova Scotia to Illinois, is that correct? Yes. So yes. you're Canadian by birth? No. No, my husband actually had a postdoc up at Dalhousie University there. Uh -huh. So we lived up there for a couple of years and okay. then came to Illinois. All right. I was going to ask, like, how was it to learn about American history? But you already had that behind you. From school. When I was growing up, in New Jersey. Every time we had a school vacation, my father would take us to a historical site of some sort. It would be Revolutionary War. If we went into Pennsylvania, then it would be Gettysburg. Uh, Virginia, we've been down there to, you know, Jamestown and Williamsburg. So that, I mean, that's what we like to do. Is Sounds like a good day. <laughs> oh yeah, he was real good. <laughs> So let me ask you, what is the relevance of deadly aim to today? What is the relevance for today? I think today, well, especially now with the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, protests that have been going on, where we all have an opportunity to become active and more aware of diversity here, I think it's important for people to understand contr more contributions that Native Americans made to our history and also, more importantly, to realize they're still here today. Sure. They are still a vital part of many communities. Um, and I just don't think it hurts to, to learn somebody's history uh, and the stories that they have to tell. It gives, it gives you a perspective on, on our times and maybe on ways that things should be done differently. So you've mentioned, you've mentioned already a favorite character, Charles Allen, I believe you said. What's like a favorite piece in the book? What is, what is something that really stands out to you in this book? Um, there are a lot of little vignettes that stand out, but I think one was another young man, uh, Joseph Gibson. And that again would be his English name given to him by an English teacher in school. Um, and he, as a young man, they were at uh, the sugar camp for their family. And 
while he was there, they would go out in February and March and, and tap the maple trees for those people who will not be familiar with that. And, and that was set up as a sugar camp, an annual spring activity. And while he was at sugar camp, he had an accident and broke the two bones in one of his lower part of one of his legs. And during the healing process, education was so important to his mother that she and his sister took turns carrying him to school every day wow. until he was completely healed. And then when Joseph went enlisted, um, he was, I think, 19 or 18, when he enlisted, he actually sold his pony and a small parcel of land that he owned so that he could leave money with the local grocer so that his mother would have credit on account while he was gone from the war to fight. And Joseph was one of the men who was uh, captured at a, at a battle called Shan Run and was taken to Andersonville Prison, and he died there. Okay. So. Wow. So let me ask you, your work, how is it being affected by the current situation of today, the pandemic, Black Lives Matter, you already mentioned, but. Well, um, for one thing, the libraries are closed, and that's. I'm at the point where I'm pulling uh, pictures together for another book and I can't get access to get in the stacks so we can get the pictures to scan them. Um, I also find, and many, maybe other writers are not finding this, but I find that, I don't know, the creative energy isn't there in the exact same way mm. right now. Uh, whether, I, I mean, normally I could sit down with a mystery and read for five hours straight. I can't do that right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether I'm thinking about things or, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, because my day is not that much, I work from home, so it's pretty much the same, but the concentration isn't there. I think it's because I'm always worrying about how many cases now does Florida have? Oh, we're going to North Carolina. Or are we going to North Carolina? Um, you know, I mean, I've got one son who lives in China and so, okay, that's a concern. And I have my daughter in, in Tennessee. She's got the viruses going up there. So I don't find that working is as easy to me to do right now because my attention's brought off in a lot of different directions. Um, that said, when I was, I, when I was working um, this past week, because I am working hard now against the deadline, I will lose myself once I sit down and start writing. Um, so... It's not there for reading anymore, the, con the, the, the concentration, but for writing when I have to, it is. <laughs> so can you let us know maybe just a little, what are you working on right now? Like what's the next? Um, well, the, the next one, which will be again, whether it's young adult or adult, I mean, it sits on that border. It's uh, about a coal mine disaster that occurred in Illinois in 1909. Okay. So, um, yeah. Weird. So let me ask you, when you found out you were a Michigan Notable Book author, how'd you react? What is, I, that was really you? cool because, you know, first of all, I mean, I'm not from Michigan, but I thought it was really nice when I was there. Um, and I knew about the award because you just hear about this stuff. Well, I think I actually heard about it initially from Chris Chopek, um, who I mentioned, he did the, the company K book. Because I think at one point he said, well, you know, it would be nice if you were one of Michigan's authors. And so I didn't really know what it was. So I looked it up when I went home and I thought, that'd be really nice if I was chosen as one of the authors. But I don't know. I didn't think it would happen. So it was just really cool to get that email that said that. And really hard to sit on that information and not share it with my publisher which I didn't. I was really good about that. Well, you could have told your publisher. I think I, did I tell oh. you, I talk to your publisher? Well, maybe, maybe I told my, maybe you did say I could do that if I told my publisher, but what I couldn't do was brag to my nonfiction author friends. Well, you couldn't so do that. that I stayed totally mum on. <laughs> yes, and you stayed, you stayed mum a good long while, and I do apologize about that. You did great. So let me ask you, finally, and you've already said a little bit, but for your book, why should readers read Deadly Aim? Why should somebody sit down and take the time to read Deadly Aim? Because they will meet a number of very interesting people who led 
I think, very interesting lives. They may learn a bit about a different culture uh, and come to appreciate uh, some of the, the trials and tribulations that other people uh, will experience during their lives. It will take them out of their own comfort zone and put them in a very different position. It may, may color the way they look at war, too. So um, that's why they should do it, because it's good. That's why. Very nice. Good way to end it. Sally Walker, thank you so much. And thank you. you very, today. very welcome. And thank you all today for uh, coming in and watching the uh, segment of Michigan Notables 2020 uh, segment with Sally Walker, author of the book Deadly Aim. Uh, just to tell you, if you want to support the Michigan Notable Book Program, uh, you can contact the Library of Michigan Foundation. Contact info, uh, information on the Library of Michigan Foundation is available in the opening and ending credits of this segment today. And thank you everyone for being here. And Sally, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. And have a wonderful day. You too.